And we are live. Welcome to the Open Mic Show. I am Reagan Ram with Orpheus Audio Academy, and I am joined by Joseph of Songwriter Theory and Chad of At Home Songwriting. Welcome in, everyone. If you have any questions, leave them in the chat, and we are going to get started answering your questions and talking about how to write better songs and more songs in 2024. Write more in 2-4. Oh, yeah, there you go. Write more in 2-4. That could be a yeah. hashtag. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Go, go on, go on. I feel, I feel, I feel, what's the what's the thought behind that? Besides, I don't know. I, I was just thinking, like you know, every year has a has a you know a little punchline, a little kick, and mm. you know maybe write more two four. That's maybe something, or maybe yeah. I just <laughs> it took me way too long. Like 2024, two four time. Oh yeah! You, oh, play on that. it took it took me a, until now to realize. Oh, it's the doing. year. Yep, we're in twenty twenty four, Joseph. You're not Welcome. one of those people like <laughs> still keeps writing the previous year, Google. the new year. Are you? Yeah, yeah. Twenty twenty four is yeah. It feels weird. Feels so, weird. Yeah, we, so Dean has a question. I don't know if we want to um, open up just talking about goals for the year. Or if we want to just dive into this question first, what do you guys think? I think, I mean, we can go to a question and then kind of yeah. loop through since Dean already okay. asked. He's, he's the first, you know, early bird gets yes. the worm. Exactly. Yeah. So he <laughs> says, help. Hopefully it's a big juicy worm. We'll see. Beginner right producer <laughs> alert. That's awesome. Congrats on being a beginner. We were all there yeah. at one point. Yes. And can you please give us the top five practical workflow steps to actually mix any synthwave track? That's so clearly a Reagan question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can take a stab at it. I don't know if you guys have any any thoughts about that or if you have any experience with Synthwave. Um, not I mean a little bit. I would say that I do have experience in mixing and and you know doing production. I would say I don't know if I'll have top five, but what I've really been learning with my own music is to really focus on less is more. Um and really to listen to what you already have and to see what might be missing from it. Right. Like I think I have fallen into the trap of watching every YouTube video under the sun, which is funny because we're on YouTube right now, but um, every person who's doing like um, uh, I'll read his question in a minute. Once I finish my thought, but um you know, everybody has some advice, like you should cut this frequency or you should start mixing this or you should do whatever. And I've gone back to really the basics of just listening to what I would call the board mix, which is just raise the faders and see what you have mm. and see how do you think, feel that you might want to sculpt it. Um, so Dean says, should you turn on all the sound levels and add one sound at a time? Um, what DB level should we start or set to? Um, one of the cool things that I've done to kind of teach my ear to balance in mixing is um, using pink noise. So I will take pink noise and I'll have it just on a channel at minus 12 dB and then go through all of the, the tracks one by one and turn them up until they're just barely audible over the pink noise. Mm -hmm. And then I mute it and then I do the rest. And then at the end, once you've gone through all of your tracks, all of your tracks are kind of balanced within their own frequency range to stand out from the pink noise. So you actually have this nice balanced place to start. That's actually um, uh, uh, level or like a uh, gain staged at minus 12. So that's something that I've, I've done in the past, but um, it's usually good to listen to everything together and then, then sort of mute things, I think, but. I don't know, uh, Reagan, what are kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's usually how I try to keep things around the minus 12 dB level. Um, as far as like, um, yeah, how do you get started in the workflow steps? Um, I actually, my, my free guide kind of walks through my whole mixing process. Um, you can get that at orpheusaudioacademy.com slash mixing checklist. And so then to, so then to answer your question, yeah, there's kind of, that's kind of the best place to start is right. Make sure, well, even before that prep work is making sure your tracks are all colored, organized, grouped, um, named, cause that can really just speed up your workflow. But mm -hmm. 
Then the first step is uh, volume balancing. And so, yeah, it's a good idea to have, you know, you turn everything down and then you turn up one instrument at a time. There's a couple of different ways, a couple of different schools of thought about going about that. Some people will say, um, start with the most important instrument. So that'd be like the vocal. Other people, uh, my mentor, for example, says start with um, the, like the bass and the drums. So work your way from bottom up, mix your way bottom up. Um, so maybe you can experiment with each of those, see which one you like better. There's pros and cons to each way to do it. Um, and then, yeah, like I try to keep everything around you know, 12 dB uh, ish, right? Cause some things are gonna be louder than other things, but that's kind of like the ceiling I try to get for the overall mix. So I don't want to go above that. So I leave enough headroom for mastering. Um, and so then, yeah, so then you just kind of bring up the other instruments as you go. If it's, if you're taking the instrument, that's the most important, you kind of just do the, what's the second most important sound, what's the third most and so on. Or if you're going bottom up, then you just go frequency wise. So you start with your, your drums and your bass and any rhythm elements and then leads and vocals mixing up that way. So those are kind of two different approaches. So maybe experiment with which, each one to see what you like. And then from there, it's just um, EQ, compression, and then effects. And that's kind of the workflow and uh, in a nutshell. And, and bouncing off of a little bit of what I feel like you both said, but going back one step farther is arrange in such a way that it's self mixing as much as you can. So a mistake that I made on the first album, I, I had it professionally mixed the first album that I did and, but we recorded it in our dorm room and the guy was like, dude, do you put everything in the mid range? <laughs> it was like, you have uh, guitars are in the mid range, pianos in the mid range, everything. And I can't speak to synth wave. So I don't know what kind of instruments you're going to be utilizing. I'm, I assume mostly synths. But think about the pitch range that you're using and think about it. Uh, I'm working on an, a, an arranging thing at the moment. And an analogy I am kind of toying with is having different rooms. Like if you have different rooms in your house, you can only fit so many people in each room where they can actually hear each other in conversation. So try to like spread it out a little bit. Don't have everything be in the same mid range. Don't have everything be bass. Don't have everything be too high. Um, and also, I, I feel like it should be kind of a bell curve. Where like you have very little actually in the base and then you have the most kind of in the mid upper mid so it's not a perfect bell curve but so that's, yeah, not that's mixing that's but it's it's something to think about before mixing is in that sort of arranging actually deciding on the parts element. yeah i will one other thing i'll add for synth wave if you're doing everything in the box which you probably are meaning everything's like in the computer you don't have a whole this outboard gear is even before EQ and compression, I would add saturation to just about every track because hmm. saturation that is really that was present in the in the 80s by default and before before we had everything digital and computers because you had a console, um, you had outboard gear. And so every piece of electrical equipment, physical equipment, is the uh, audio signal is converted to an electrical signal and has to go through those boxes of you know, circuitry and transistors and all that stuff. And that adds what's called saturation. So that's subtle distortion and compression to each element. So you're going through the microphone, the preamp, the mixing console into a uh, tape recorder back into the, the mixing console and then getting adding effects, compression, EQ, uh, you know, reverb delay, all that stuff. That's all adding saturation. So, um, so if you want to create that kind of authentic sound, it's going to have, uh, you know, back in the 80s, everything had all this saturation back, baked into it before you even did any mixing. So that's something you might want to consider is using different plugins that kind of replicate that or just saturator tools to add saturation. That's going to make a huge difference, right? You don't want to get to the point where everything sounds distorted, but just adding that extra warmth, those extra harmonics to your sounds will sound that make them sound a lot more. Um, authentic and synth wavy. And then Chad, did I you saw... want to address the pink noise question? Yeah, I was going to. So, so there's different types of noise. So the noise that most everybody is familiar with is white noise. So that would be the noise that comes out of your TV when it's in between channels or TVs used to do that. TVs now go to a blue screen and they just say no input. But back in the day, the olden days, TVs used to go shh. <laughs> and what That's white noise is is it's 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 random 
it's it's noise of all frequencies. So there's all frequencies happening at the same level. So that's white noise. Pink noise is actually uh, the level of each octave of frequency is uh, balanced in a certain way, or they're at a certain level to where the frequencies are matched in volume. So the thought here is if you have a high pitched sound, it, it, even if it's at the same level, it will appear louder to the human ear. So mm -hmm. what pink noise has been done, it's been adjusted. So the lower frequencies are higher in level and it's, it's sort of balanced all the way down the spectrum um, within that curve or it's a slant. So it slants from 20, 20 Hertz down to like 20 kilohertz. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a volume adjusted noise based on octave. Hmm. Is brown that noise right? would be the, again, I mean, that's how I, because I know brown noise is like bassier than white noise. Think, and I knew uh, pink noise was another alteration on white noise, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was. Noise, was yeah. It's just equal energy per octave is kind of the, right. the shorthand. Short so what's definition. the, what's brown noise? Is that just bass accentuated? Of white noise because because like thunderous right like like brown noise is way more pleasant to listen to than white noise and i know it's because of more bassiness but i wonder if it's like the opposite of what pink noise so, is where instead it's like an emphasis on i don't know not no yeah so, so a lot of a lot of what they call like ai um like auto mastering software you know how you put your music in and then it it masters it and it supposedly adjusts the the frequencies. Mm. A lot of them start by frequency matching or EQ matching your song to a pink noise input. So what it's doing is it's trying to balance your song octave by octave. So it matches the pink noise. And most speaker companies, mm -hmm. when they tune speakers like car car companies and things like that, they use pink noise as a standard in order to tune speakers. So if you can, if you can adjust your frequency ranges to where they're sort of leveled and balanced, it's a good place to start. Not always a good place to end because it, it can be sort of boring in a mix perspective, but mm -hmm. it's a good way to sort of hear, especially if your room's not tuned, it can help you see if you're, if you have too much bass, if you have too much treble, like all of that, what's happening. So yeah, it's, it's, complicated but simple at the same time for what it's worth apparently brown noise is pink noise on steroids because it has even more of an emphasis it's even steeper of a curve where it's really bass accentuated according to one chart which i will assume is correct <laughs> also uh dean thank you so much for the super chat uh that really means a lot thank you so much Ooh. reagan has himself a super fan <laughs> awesome it's good stuff I've experimented uh, with all different types of noises for risers and such. Technic Tone says Sound Toys Decapitator is great for saturation. That is definitely a great one. I've not used it myself, but I've had a lot of people say good things about it. Hmm. For saturation, I've used um, Waves Audio. If you want tube saturation, their Magma plugins mm -hmm. are really those. nice tube. Um, I've also used Black Box through Plugin Alliance um, as a saturator. I have the Abbey Road saturator from Waves too, but that seems to be really distorted really fast. So it doesn't add as much subtle saturation for me, but I think mm -hmm. it really works well if you're doing like really in your face drums. Um, but I haven't used it too much to really know. Yeah, and your every DAW probably has some saturators built in. I know Logic has a lot of hidden saturator tools. For example, the compressors can be used as saturators. The, there's a, um, I guess what's called a distortion knob on those. There's like soft, medium, and hard or something. And so if you like put it on soft and then it'll add some some uh, saturation, they also have their vintage EQs. So you think this is just EQ, right? But no, if you actually turn the, uh, I forget what they're called each one, if it's like it might be input or it might be, I think it's probably, I think it's called like input or something or gain. If you just turn that up, uh, no, it wouldn't be gain. But I think it's like input. If you turn that up, that'll actually add some saturation as well. So um, each DAW probably has some saturated tools built in if you just want something that's free. Um, can I 
share my i found a picture of pink noise actually uh i think Ooh. you can i think it should pop up oh, did we share. fix that since last time i thought did last it... time we couldn't do that or am i misremembering oh, did we not i thought we were able to do that i also. do see that i have a present button so i assume chad does too let's see yeah i can add that Woo. nice can you see that yeah absolutely so that's that's pink noise so mm -hmm. it, that's see how it lower sounds if you the reason why it goes down is because the higher the frequency, the more loud it appears to the human ear. Mm -hmm. So what pink noise does is by lowering the higher frequencies, it it has the same apparent level or it has the same volume as the other frequencies. So that's what they mean when it's a balanced um, frequency level. If you let bass get out of control, your mix is just shafted. Because <laughs> bass is way louder and affecting your speakers mm -hmm. way more than what you actually hear. Right. And this all yeah. comes back to this, the Fletcher Munson curve. Hmm. So you can I zoom in? I was just trying to find a website. Um, this thing's spaghetti model here, which if you live in Florida might trigger you. But um, <laughs> what this is, is depicting is how the human ear perceives different fre frequencies at different uh, volume levels. So, right, mm -hmm. so pink noise is equal energy per octave. And so you think, well, shouldn't it be flat all the way across? So the reason it's like that is because um, we actually hear higher frequencies better than lower frequencies, right? You know, this is true. If you turn down a song, listen to it at a low volume level, the bass kind of disappears. So that's what you see here. You're kind of losing the bass, right? Um, so the horizontal frequency or the horizontal here, the X axis is frequency. And then the Y axis here is volume level. So the, the volume level we hear the best is like right around 1K. And you hear the most accurately all the frequency levels at about 85 to 90 dB, which is why when you're using EQ, you actually want to make sure you crank your monitors up to 85 to 90 dB. And then the rest of the time when you're mixing, you can mix at lower volume levels. But if you're making... EQ decisions at a lower volume level, then you're probably going to be putting in too much bass because you're not hearing enough. Yep. And I everything so and everything noise. sounds better loud, but that's not yeah. a good thing when you're mixing. Yeah. Yeah. Ear fatigue, hearing loss. That's all. It's a, it's surprising how many um, music like YouTubers I've heard talk about how they're losing their hearing. I don't know if you've come across this so that's probably yeah that's something i'd be careful of uh, is protecting your your hearing mm. yeah no, i know like adam, um, adam ivy says he lost his hearing andrew huang says he was i don't know if this is still the case he was losing his hearing um someone else said they're losing their hearing that pretty it's a music youtuber anyway what interesting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry dad joke the, the 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 worst part of that is you never i feel like there's no way to know because theoretically, you don't think it's that loud if you are listening loud enough to damage your ears. So right? I actually I actually use this. I use a sound level meter um, and I had read somewhere that like Serban Gania, who's one of the top mixers, uh, he mixes at around 65 dB. Um, so I try to stay like 65 to 75. So I actually measure it. And I can tell when my ears are getting tired because I feel like I want to turn it up. But I always go back to like, what is the, mm -hmm. what is the level? And this thing was cheap and you can get apps on your phone that do it. Yeah. About it. Yeah, I, have a, I have a free app on my mm -hmm. phone to measure. So yeah, that's, that's, that's about right about the volume level you want to listen to. Basically you want to be able to have a conversation with someone else in the room without having to raise your voice. That's like what you typically mix at, except when you're using mm -hmm. EQ, right? When you go to make those EQ decisions, yep. you crank it up and then you turn it back down. And what I've been doing too with mixing is I will mix for 20 minutes and then I will take a five minute break and I'll set a timer for each of those because I'm notorious for mixing until like literally I'm going crazy and everything sounds the same and then I'm yep. tricking myself and it's been a really good exercise to like set a timer for 20 minutes, stop, then set a timer for five minutes and then go back and do that. And I don't, that actually has helped me go longer before I actually lose my objectivity, which has been good. Mm. Definitely. Which 
is why counter counterintuitively sometimes you actually produce better quality music when you mix fast than mm -hmm. thinking oh, i'm really going to take my time on this and spend a lot of time on it well no because you're you're working against the clock anytime you mix because you're going to lose your objectivity you're going to get listening fatigue and everything's going to start to sound the same and you can't really tell a difference and you're going to think you're going crazy and that's the same for the pros who you know work in big commercial recording studios they know that they're they got to go quickly and they know if they hit a wall sometimes they just have to stop and come back the next day yep All cosmics right. music says great idea lose track of time while producing occasionally everything sounds the same yeah Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. Or like mixing is one of the more maddening processes just because of the. I, I think mixing is one of those. I don't, I don't know if it's an exception to what most things are. At, at some point, there's always diminishing returns, but I think diminishing returns hits way sooner than you would think for mixing. So, like, for mm -hmm. example, I, I would argue that the vast majority of the time at least lyrics that took 30 hours are going to be better than the ones that took 30 minutes. Uh, at some point there is diminishing returns for sure. I don't know when that hits. Maybe it's at hour 10. Maybe it's at, at, at I don't pretend to know where that is, but it's way later than it is for mixing for sure. Like you can tell, or I, I, I feel like usually you can tell for like lyric writing or something. This was written in two days and this was written in, you know, over the course of months taking their time. But mixing is one of those where, like, if it was mixed in two hours, that's probably great. <laughs> like, which is a hard, I feel like that's a hard, especially for those out there that are songwriters and trying to produce their own music and mix their own music. I feel like that's a hard shift sometimes to make. Not to mention, like, you're wearing a different hat, mm -hmm. right? E even between something like songwriting and producing, it's not the same hat. Like, theoretically, you could be a great producer and a terrible songwriter or vice versa. Um, because it's, it's just a totally different skill set in the same way that mixing is a totally different skill set with different rules and different um, different traits in a person that would be better for mixing or worse for mixing. Like for mixing, maybe impatience would actually be helpful. <laughs> I would argue for songwriting, <laughs> it's probably not. Um, but yeah, Elliot it comes to Thorpe. Times. Excellent name, by the way. It's, yeah, Elliot, Elliot Easton guitarist for the cars recorded their first album in 11 days and then mixed in nine days so yeah mixing you definitely you're probably gonna depending on how much you're doing but yeah one day per song that's i've seen that that's pretty common um because yeah you do want to get that right at the source and yeah so and going back to what joseph said with arrangement so yeah you really want to set yourself up with your recordings and then the arrangement so that you don't have, you have to do as little mixing as possible. In fact, I don't know if I should say this, but the, the, the song I recently released, a Christmas song I released, I didn't really mix. I wrote it and then I just released it the next day. And hmm. it's actually my most popular song now. So, um, I mean, technically I probably mixed it somewhat. Now all the, there's no vocals and all the instruments were, um, virtual they're all just synths and stuff so um when you're using you know virtual instruments that doesn't that requires less mixing than if you're recording yeah, raw instruments sure. or and especially vocals so mm -hmm. but that's just something to keep in mind if you're using a lot of um virtual instruments or samples then that cuts down on the mixing you have to do yeah also I on the cars story just just as a maybe aside always be careful what lessons we get from like a certain pro, like any certain pro, right? Because there's always going to be an example of anything, right? There's probably an example of an all-time great mixer who's like, oh, I, I take a month for every song. It probably exists. I don't know if it does. <laughs> but in the, in the same way, right, it's just be very careful to not over attach yourself to a way that a band that you liked did it because there's a lot of factors, right? And, and in some cases it might be, you know, how many instruments are they using? If they're using way more instruments than you, then maybe it should take them longer to mix because there's just more stuff to do. Or if there's fewer instruments, it might be more self-mixing or to Reagan's point, it's more self-mixing if you're using VSTs, which I think is partially why so many 
producer, like all the famous like EDM producers, I feel like a lot of them kind of mix their own songs. So it's kind of this hybrid of like they produce, they write, and they also mix. But it's like it's easier to be a mixer of that compared to somebody who's trying to mix, I don't know, guitar, electric guitars that were recorded in an imperfect room. And, you know, the amp kind of has some weird issues because it's an old amp. Um, so so just just be careful about don't with with any example. Right. I mean, because people do the same thing with like, oh, music theory isn't useful because some artist I like didn't know it. Like, just be very careful to ever go down that road for for anything. Um, so to come to Thorpe, just just think about like what feels right for your song is would be my side recommendation. I think I think that's the key with all of this. I think that's the key with songwriting. I think it's the key with mixing it all comes down to what is getting the right emotional reaction that you're looking for. Right. Like, I don't think it has any, I don't, I don't think time necessarily is the factor that makes something good or not. I think it really depends on like the performance. It depends on just how it came out. Like, I do think there are times where you literally could write a song in 10 minutes and that's probably as good as it's going to be. I also think there's songs that if you spent like six months on it, you're wasting your time <laughs> throwing glitter on a turd, right? Like that song is sure. not going to get better than it is. You have to like know when it's really a turd and you have to just flush it. For sure. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree on the first one, but this, the second part I is saw that. I saw true. that eye roll. <laughs> well, I, I, I know. That was not an eye roll. That was a eyebrow raise. If I remember <laughs> that's, that's because when I watch your videos, Joseph, that's the thing that I'm like, I totally disagree with yeah. you. I, I, I have to side with Chad on that one, definitely disagree on that. I have to side with Chad. It, it depends on the song. Because sometimes you're just capturing the muse. Sometimes it, it comes to you. And, it, yeah, and yeah, it's but great. Yeah, but the muse is the exception. And, not and the more you do. I don't but know. The, that's, how, that's how I write all my songs. I, for I, the most I, part. I, I, I would, I would, say, I would say this. I would say this. Everything has to have like a average time or like, for instance, can you write a book in a month? Yes. But probably, probably if you were to average out a trillion books written in a month versus the ones that they took the full year and did the full editing, I would guess that on average, the year long books would absolutely obliterate all the Nano Remo books. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some Nano Remo books that are way better. There aren't people that, you know, kept whatever the phrase is, you know, they had a losing hand, but they kept doubling down with a bad book for the year long one. But I think there's something to be said for some form of bell curve of time on average. I mean, I. I do think that's almost a rite of passage that at some point you write a song that magically comes together in like half an hour and it really is lyrically and everything just. But I think most of the time, especially for lyrics. On average. I, I just I just would be very suspicious of lyrical quality if on average it took an hour to write lyrics. Yeah, I I'd know, like to see an I exception to that. It so far, I think it just so depends. See, I don't I think, think that's maybe necessarily it true. Maybe it I don't does. think that I don't think that's true either because it, 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 first off who's the judge of what's good and who's bad what's good and bad, right? Like there's no science behind it. It's all just art. Because yeah, but that you, doesn't mean that it's fully subjective. It just means it's very hard to have that discussion. Right? So, like but, but if you're taking a month to write a song because I, I honestly, like, I'm asking this as, like, I'm curious because if it's taking me a, a month to get a song to where I think it's actually decent, like, I would be so bored with it, I would have thrown it away long before a month. So I'm curious from you, Joseph, at a month, if you're spending a month working on a song, at that point, what are you actually adjusting at that point? Well, it's not necessarily active work. Right. It's a part of it is waiting for the right idea that will carry. So, for for instance, you might have a situation where you just have the bridge work lyric is just not working and you don't know exactly why. And, you know, you can put in some work and try to figure out, OK, what really should the bridge be saying? Because clearly what I'm trying to say here just doesn't isn't quite right. 
Um, so sometimes it's just like time. It's not necessarily like active work. I honestly have no idea on the actual number of hours that it takes on average. I know music is way faster than lyrics. Um, and I'm usually suspicious of lyrics that I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm naturally suspicious of any situation where that isn't the case. Cause I think music is just music is something where like, it's, it's just easier and more natural to come up with. For instance, you could argue that on average, if you have, let's say just a verse, a bridge and a chorus, you have to write three melodies. And you could argue that if it's A, B, A, B, you effectively have to write two phrases times three, six phrases, and your song is done, right? So all you need is six good phrases and the music is done. For lyrics, that's not true, right? Like there's there's always going to be more to it than that. So, um, so when I say taking longer than an hour or I don't know exactly the number of hours that it takes, but it's some blend of working on it until it gets in the right direction, letting it sit for a while. Cause I'm never working on one song at a time. Like never, I would, I would once in a great while, I'll take like three days in a row and work on one song. But for the most part, it's pushing on the song that feels like it's most likely to go well that day combined with, you know, if it's a song that I think is one, I want to be on a e EP that's happening sooner then I'll put more effort into that. But do you, do you instantly think then if you just pooped out a song, like let's say you wrote a song tonight and you're like, wow, I just like the muse struck. I wrote it. Do you instantly think then that that first verse isn't the best it could be? No, I think, I think there's a sense of, when a line says what <clears throat> exactly it needs to say and when it doesn't. Um, actually, now I'm in the habit where I will take the text in my Google Doc and I will change it to green when I say this lyric is it's exactly what I want to say. Um, that way I know don't even don't even like this is set. We're good. Um, I think it's way less likely that that's going to be the case. But it, it can happen. It has happened. I just think it's the exception, not the rule. Um, That's but, interesting. But it's, for me, it, it I depends would say too it's on like how. I would say for me, the the rule is the less time I spend on something, the better quality it is. Which I know sounds really counterintuitive, but that's probably true like 80% of the time for me. Musically or lyrically? I would say musically both. makes more sense to me than lyrically. I would say I would say both actually. I don't know. I could be just, I could just be me. I think everyone has a different style. So I don't think there's any real hard or that fast is a rule there. But I've been yeah. a writer. I've been writing before I did music. I've been writing since I was in middle school. I've written a bunch of novels, been in competitions. So I've been writing for a long time, written maybe I, probably a thousand blog posts at this point in my life. So that could be part of it too. I've lost They're very different writing. writing though, right? I mean, I, I feel like true. Like, it is a different style. I do but... compare it to novel writing in some ways, but in some ways it's very different, right? Novel writing yeah. is more. But of I know a even with novel writing, because I've I've um, gotten some coaching in that area for how to go about publishing novels, and they they even say like you gotta you gotta keep it going even in the editing like that should well, only yeah, take a month. No, that's what I'm saying though. Like I so I just don't think that that equates because if you think you about you don't really want to spend book, a whole year editing. Because then you're probably well, yeah. being inefficient. You're probably um, getting too down in the weeds. And as I think it was Napoleon Bonaparte said, that quantity has a quality all of its own. And so at some point, especially in the indie realm, if you're wanting to really put out content, put out your you know, you know books, your music, which is kind of volume is kind of important for you know building a fan base, building a career, then you can't really get bogged down too much. But but now you're. I, I definitely hear what you're There's saying a too. Big I definitely difference hear... between the artistic quality of something and what is best for somebody to become popular. Those rules are wildly different. I don't even think it's it's related. I, I think there's no connection whatsoever. None, right? Like you could pump out a song a day, and absolutely that will help you be, get more popular, whether or not your songs are better. But it is just like more. I mean, it's like YouTube videos, right? At some point, if you put out enough YouTube videos, quality matters for sure. But like to grow your YouTube channel, I think you're I not going to like best. make one great 
YouTube video best, that is just going to take off. I think in the beginning, for for most things, you need to focus on quantity. And sure. then once you master that, you focus on quality. And then once you're a pro, once you're an expert, then you do both. I think that's what that's what we see. Like the people that are really skilled, they've mastered yeah. both quantity and quality. Now, music's yeah. a little different, right? Especially if you're looking at like pop stars, but like for like people in the, the indie world that are that are successful, whether it be novelists, whether it be music artists, they've mastered both of those. Yeah, I I the the thing about it, what what I don't want newer writers to hear is that you need to trust your own artistic judgment. Like the song needs work if you think it needs work, right? Like if it's good and you like it, don't question your judgment unless you get feedback from somebody else who thinks they know what they're doing. But the thing is, is nobody knows really what they're doing. So I, I've seen a lot of people get really paralyzed in their creativity because they try to spend so much time on a song when really what they should be doing is trying more songs and really getting a sense of what tools actually work and what what actually like gets them to where they want to go. I think the the thing about it um, for for me is it's like you sort of get a, a, the more that you do it, you become a better writer and eventually you write better songs, right? I think the first step is becoming good at the process and then you start to think about the results, right? I don't think there's very many people who write four songs and those songs are the best thing that have ever happened to everyone. Like it just doesn't work that way. Most people that you hear that become professional songwriters will tell you they have been writing songs since they were kids or they've, they've done it for, for years and years. So it's not that they're, cause if you're very inexperienced, how do you even know what to adjust, right? It all comes down to, does it fit what you want to do? So what Joseph, what you're saying is you're like, well, I don't think the bridge is saying what I wanted to say. That's different than right. focusing on some imaginary like quality standard, right? Because the right. quality standard is always changing. Yeah. If you're not happy with it, by all means, I'm, I'm making a value means, judgment yeah. of the quality of my bridge. Right. It, I could pump it out that way, but I know that it's not working. So like it, it's still a quality judgment. It's, it's right. Just, it's just right. a, yeah, if you a part of it is going to be like. It's, it's like anything else, right? You can you can dive as deep into the crafting versus just go as you want. And there, I, I agree with every I think pretty much everything you guys just said. We're like early on, you should qu focus on quantity. I am less. I less agree with the oh qu quantity leads to quality. I think that's I understand that almost all those trite phrases are not technically true. They just like have elements of helpful truth to them. Uh, but I think like, OK, I keep writing songs in 15 minutes. Let's see if that really is true. And I'm sure it's not. Uh, maybe, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everybody should just write a song minutes. a minute until it finally works. Uh, but I, you know, I know that's taking the claim to an extreme, but that's what you do when somebody makes a claim, right? It's like, well, at the extreme, it's definitely not true. So it makes it arguable whether so, it's true at all. But so, oh, go ahead. I didn't. Yeah. So I, to, to me, like a, a part of a part of the writing slash crafting process is is making value judgments like that and not. Like there's just going to be a different standard that everybody has too, right? And to uh, one of you said it, I think Reagan said, it, style comes into it as well, right? If if like for all the people that think simple is good, I disagree fundamentally. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think the opposite is true either. But some people think that. If you're a person that thinks that, then yeah, probably you're more likely to get a lyric that to you is earlier on because we think simpler by default right we talk we talk in simple language uh, relative at least to what we would consider flowery or poetic but poetic is always going to take longer if you lean into more poetic flowery language that is probably going to take longer most of the time but a part of it too is just that 
there has to be some element of, of course, everything, how much you put into it is going to show to a degree, right? So to my original point that I think this whole side tangent slash discussion came off of, um, to me, there, ha there has to be a, a, some form of bell curve where like, I don't buy that like in the first hour is where the bell curve is like, Oh, your song after the first hour, it's probably going downhill. Now you're probably tinkering with something that's good as it is. And it's just getting worse. Well, I, I don't think that's that. true. I think it depends. So, it just depends on the song. I think that's all we're saying is just, well, it depends on the song. If yeah, it's, but of course it depends some on songs, the song. Yeah. Some songs I've really had to labor through and it's like, it's just not yeah. coming. Well, I never said um, that every song, this is true. I said on average, my, my original mm -hmm. comment was that on average, on average, a so, song absolutely, I think, I think takes bag. more than like an hour to get it to where it needs to be. And I said, I don't know what the number is. I threw out the number of 40 hours. It's probably less than that. I don't really know. But I, it's maybe around 10. Ooh, I definitely don't ooh. think it's one. I know that I don't think it's one. I'm fairly confident that it's not one, at least on the lyrical side. So uh, from a I don't know where the number is, but there has to be an average, right? Like they're just, they're, there just has to be, um, which is maybe so worth thinking about at least because i don't know to me like if, if a songwriter is out there and they're like every song i write writes half an hour to me that's a flag if, if if nobody has ever written a song that took them more than a half an hour i immediately question what the highest quality they ever got to was partially because i've seen many of those songs and usually it's like yep i can tell that you wrote that in a half an hour which if they're fine with that is fine. But like there is an element of like crafting versus just writing and being done. I think but, on average you can tell. But I think it matters how many half an hours they've sessions there have been. Sure. Because someone who has 10,000 half hour ses sessions is going to probably write better than someone who has 50 half hour sessions, right? Um, oh, yeah. One of the things that I notice in the lyric class that I teach for Berkeley is the students write something every single day, five days a week for 12 weeks. So every day they're writing something and there is a marked difference between the things that they write in week one versus what they write in week 12. So I do think there is a, a quantity skill based thing versus the, the time as well, but it depends on what you're focused on. If you're just going in and going off your own instincts, and if you start off on the wrong foot, you're going to just do a lot of practicing of bad technique or bad skill, right? Sure. But I think what Reagan was saying too with um, novel writing, with like screenplay writing, with, you know, those types of things, there are definite tools and techniques and tendencies that people can learn. So it doesn't have to take them a long amount of time so they can worry about the content instead of the structure because i think there's a separation between that as well so if you know the structure and you know what are options and what tools you have in your toolbox you actually can write better faster i think yeah i don't think i don't think i've ever said anything that opposes that right but, but there's a big difference between saying like of, of course i think i did an episode or something about this recently like if, if, you were to, if you were to find though. a way, if so you were to here. find a way to measure a songwriter, it's got to be quality of songs over time, right? A songwriter who pumps out 10 great songs in a year, and that's it, is a better songwriter than one who pumps out one great song a year. A songwriter who pumps out 100 average songs in a year over 10 average songs a year, first one's better. Where it gets more interesting is... You know, somebody could pump out a song a day, but if they're all like nobody would ever want to listen to them versus somebody who pumps out 10 songs a year, but they're all pretty good. What's better? Right. Like, and that's where like, it becomes an interesting, which it's not about that. Right. It's just about like you have to push, I think, in both quality and quantity. And I think all of us are maybe start being resistant by being resistant to because because we're all going to start in one camp or another, right? It seems to me that that especially when we start, most of us are either over tinkerers by default or people who just don't want to be told that hey, if you want better quality to some degree, time is going to play into it. And I think de depending on which type we are, 
we should push in the opposite direction. So for me, mm -hmm. I put a concerted effort into pushing on quantity because I'm by default somebody who like, I want to get it exactly right as I define it. Um, and, and for other people like me, then yes, we should concentrate on efficiency. Um, but I think the opposite is true too, because I, I don't know, like, of, of course it is. Like, I, I think it's just one of those things where like, for everybody, you need to figure out where you are on that spectrum and then push in the opposite direction. Because anybody who does write every song, or if somebody out there writes most of their songs in an hour, that's that's fine. But like, I would argue you can learn a lot and you might grow as a songwriter more so if you started pushing more on the quality and focusing on crafting the details more. Whereas somebody like me who has leaned towards being an um, over tinkerer, we might have to agree to disagree and move on. Uh, I will say real quick, sometimes, sometimes a situation forces your hand though. You don't really have it, the luxury of time because uh, some, sometimes I work uh, freelance for a local studio as an arranger and the, this one client, they only had, you know, they wanted me to write some songs for them. They only had the budget for two hours per song. So I had to write two different songs and uh, two hours per song, so a total of four hours. And so I had to get that written and delivered to the client. And that's just kind of sometimes when you're working in the the, the music industry, um, you're kind of time is limited and you're kind of forced to to get things done. So um, it's a separate that's, point. Though. That's something else to consider. But that's a yeah, we, point, we might have that, to agree. That has nothing to, agree to do with disagree. the core of the argument. And, and no, you, now just, you're just going yeah. on tangents that have nothing to do with the initial no, no. point at all. <laughs> that I just, like, I that, just I don't, don't, I think that's uh, obviously totally different because you just, I just have don't to do think, it for financial. Like, that's, I just don't think, I think there were good songs have. though. I think there were some of my best songs. Yeah. And they might be. I also, I just don't think that we should like people should put a stopwatch on their creativity. So like saying that, like, if everybody writes songs in an hour, well, how can those songs be good? Sometimes they are, you know what I mean? Like, like sometimes they really are. So I, I, I worry that if someone out there writes a song in an hour, they would doubt that it's good because somebody's on YouTube says, well, if you wrote it in an hour, it can't be that great. Right. But what if it is? I think yeah. every song is different. I think I agree with. Okay, first of all, I've never Thorpe said here. the thing you just said, just to be very clear, and I never will say that. But if all of your songs take an hour, I, I've, it, I, I, I feel like I made my point clear. Uh, what, yeah, I don't, like, I don't like, think any. I think we. I think we all are close to agreeing here. We we coming yeah. out from different angles. Because yeah, I don't think any of us are saying it all should always be in one way. I think every song is different. Or I think. To comes to Thorpe sums it up well. He says, I'm thinking of lots of stories of artists talking about how their greatest songs just came to them in an instant, right? I think we can all think no stories of and artists that wrote a song really fast and it was great. Other stories where they had parts of their greatest songs that sat for years and they couldn't put all the parts together and you know it took them, you know, many times because others uh, were needed to finish them. So yeah, we there's all kinds of stories. Like I had this song for 10 years and I was working on it for 10 years on and off and finally released it and it's this big hit. Other people, it was really fast. So I think every song's just different. Every situation is different. I think I think to the point of what, what was brought up about some artists say it comes to them in an instant. I think what Joseph is actually saying is like, like just because your idol says that they did that doesn't mean you necessarily can do that. I think that's might be what you're saying too, mm, right? No, no. Oh. Again, I've had the magical, like it came together in a half an hour and as great as is. What I'm saying is that I don't believe that's the average experience. I think that happens. I think probably everybody, if they songwrite, if they write songs for five, 10 years, they will have that magical song that comes together and works within a half hour or an hour. And it's great. Where I think most people go wrong is they start to think, oh, that's how all songs should be. And I think that that, if anything, that's the exception, not the rule. And everybody who tells them, oh, like songs should take an hour. To me, that's saying that that should be the rule, not the exception. And I, 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 I just think for anything creatively, that's always going to be I the think, exception, not the rule. Like the painting think, that they thought of and just did in 10 minutes and it's their greatest painting. That happens. 
but I, I don't think it's something where like that's going to be the average experience. And I'm not saying the average is going to be like 500 hours and take you years either. Yeah, but I think again to what I said now multiple times in perhaps different ways, but like whatever category a songwriter is in, I think they need to work on pushing in the direction that they are not naturally. So again, in my case, I 100% concede that I have leaned towards Tinkerer, which is why now I try to do a song sprint once a week to push on the efficiency side. But I think that that goes in both directions. And I don't, I don't, I, I would say that it would be unwise for somebody who writes like, cause sometimes I'll get like emails or something where somebody will like brag about like, Oh, I write all my songs in a half an hour. That's fine. But in almost all cases, in almost all cases, I think, well, you're a person then that should push yourself to try to craft more and work on the quality side instead of the instead of the quantity side in the same way that I'm a person that needs to push in the opposite direction. I don't think like everybody should just push towards efficiency. Like that's obviously not true. And then just connecting to some what somebody said earlier, like, yeah, it's true that like the more books you write or the more songs you write on average, it should take you probably less time. I think that's true. But at some point, it like you can't write so many books that eventually you write a book in a day, right? That cannot be done. Like li literally your fingers cannot even move that fast physically. Oh, like known, Brandon I've Sanders, authors okay, regardless, <laughs> you know that my oh. central point is true. So like Brandon Sanderson has written a ton of books. I think he's a better writer now than he was before, but like he does, he's not, it's not like he pumps out 10 books a year now he still for the most part does the well, one I think it also depends on what your goals sessions, are but what your goals are is influences too well i think we're all saying the same thing though that it really comes down to the song right and i don't think we've talked about this before too where it's like you don't want to paint yourself as this is the writer that i am because you have to sort of adjust to what the song is wanting to do right like some songs might just be complete they're just they're just done and others are like they need to be watered a little bit before they grow, which is both ways are right, right? Like everything is right. I think as That's what I've been saying, you guys have been saying, you guys have been the ones that are saying like, oh, I don't know if a song takes 40 hours. Just to be clear, I've been the one that has been saying both have their place since the beginning. You guys have been saying, oh, I think it's a flag if it takes you more than 10 hours. So for the record... For the record, I don't remember that's what saying I that. said. That is not what you guys said. And we can go back and review the tape because you guys immediately went down my throat when I said my initial point was no. that, hey, on average, I think the bell curve is like probably 10 hours are where most songs maybe sit. And you guys were like, no. So for the record, no. for the record, everyone can go review the tape. Your nuanced <laughs> take is what I have been saying for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> No, what, what I was not. doing, I was, I was okay, just regardless. Doing, I was just, I was starting this giving you crap that sometimes I don't agree with what you say on yeah. your YouTube videos, but that's okay because yeah, no, there's not there, nobody's right or wrong because there's no rules in any of this, right? Like it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple, multiple ways to be successful. When it comes don't to worry. Music. I won't, Tecumseh. <laughs> I will not, <laughs> especially when my view is blatantly misrepresented. I will never back down. That's not a thing that I ever let happen. Hey, you gotta yeah. have gotta have some villains in your life, Joseph. We we can be the, the villains. I tonight. that that is not my goal here. I don't I don't want any. I don't need any. I don't need any <laughs> villains. But but I do recognize that I am in. I this this take of mine is one of those that is not the popular thing to say. If you look at your like any songwriter YouTuber, I'm probably the lone or close on my side that I think most people should be spending more time. Um, and I recognize that and I embrace that. I don't, I, I, I don't buy that just cause a lot of people yeah, don't say change. Thing that must don't be change. True. No, I, I'm I not love, going to, I I'm love that you have a different opinion. To. Love it. Right. Yeah. So then I guess we probably also, also, I think we should thing. call out that technic tone said something fantastic that i noticed a while ago but it should be called it some songs need to brew others pour out of you that is fantastic yeah that's what we all said at some, some it's, point it's it's well well yeah again that was my point from literally the first the first thing mm -hmm. i said maybe second i just think it's a really clever coffee-esque way to put it and i thought it deserved a call out because it's so it it was 
It's so short, but so clear. Well said, Technic Tone. You're, Maybe Technic Tone should be hosting this instead of us. Yeah. Yeah. He should be more, on here. More succinct of... and brief. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, ironically, it's not, we're it's spending, not like we're ignoring we're questions. We're spending an hour asking, asking, talking about one subject. We should just Do, answer it in one sentence. Like Technic I mean, Tone. I think it's an important subject, though, right? I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I think it's an important subject. But, it is. Oh, maybe it he's is. talking about beer. That's it. It doesn't. <laughs> Either one works. I prefer the coffee one, but that's okay. Either one is. <laughs> it depends on work. what your beverage of choice is. Yeah. Some songs need to. Yeah, it could be either one. Now I'm curious, Technic Tone, if you're still here, let us know which one you were thinking of. <laughs> All right, should we move on to another subject? Yeah. Well, you must have Great. another subject since you want us to move well, on to one. I don't know if this is. What if we like getting Joseph yeah. Wild? I don't know if this topic <laughs> is good, or I'm not. I need to read the room better. But how do you finish more music faster in 2024? Yeah, I, I can start with just what my plan is, and you guys can bounce off of right. that. What your plan is, or thought on it, or whatever. Um, so I actually started this last late last year, and. Uh, Chad was one of the people that I, I forget. I think it was in our, our our stream that was just together, but did get me thinking about how I did need to concentrate more on the efficiency and just kind of get it outside, um, which again I agree with. <laughs> uh, so uh, because of that, I decided once a week I want to try to aim for what I call a song sprint, which is literally I set a timer on my phone for an hour and force myself to finish, start to finish a song. Um, so far, my experience has been that the music is usually fine if pared down from what I would usually do. Um, like, for example, usually it results in like closer to a four chord song. Uh, it's more rare that I will take, you know, have a bridge that has its own interesting piano part and a verse with its own interesting piano part. So it tends to be a little more bare bones or whatever. Uh, and then the lyrics usually need more work, but it's a great exercise to just get out of your own head. Uh, so that's a once a week thing that I have. Um, and then three times a week recording and three times a week, at least songwriting. And when I say songwriting, I mean like a normal, the process that I would normally do, which may involve editing the lyrics that I did in the song sprint. Um, but there's something that, that I started at the uh, probably November, maybe. Uh, I, I think it's been going really well, especially for those of you out there maybe struggling with finding time for what it's worth. I, I, I do it at 11 to 12. That's like my time every night because everybody else is in bed. Um, what else better are you going to do at 11 to 12 o'clock at night? And also, Sweet. like, I find an hour. Well, sure. <laughs> also, like, there's something about an hour that I think is it, it's a lot of people we can discount an hour like, Oh, I, in order to songwrite, I need like 30 hours straight. I need a whole weekend by myself in a cabin in Maine. But like, you'd be surprised how, you know, maybe give yourself 10 minutes where it will take a little while to get ticking. But by minute 10 or so often you're, you're getting, you're really getting going. And then um, also with recording an important part because anybody who follows my channel at all knows that I'm very upfront about my bugaboo is recording, not writing. Uh, finishing songs is not necessarily a problem that I have, but finishing recording of really vocals is my thing. But Reagan pointed out, I have my guitars back there and, and joked that I was trying to like, I forget what the joke was. Basically, flexing. basically I'm fle flexing. Joseph's flexing with all his guitars in the background. Yeah. But actually, the reason is this is where I record music, and this is my vocal booth right here that you can see this clock. More flexing. So, so literally, yes, my <laughs> vocal booth. That's from twenty dollar Amazon packing blankets. That's super flexing. Uh, but, but anyway, the guitars are back there, literally because I'm trying to reduce the friction to recording. And now, if I want to record guitar, I have my my audio interface right here. I grab a guitar from right there. Just taking that little extra time. Uh, it's a Laguna to answer to come to this question that I see pop up. Uh, yes. I don't know why I second thought that for a second. I wish it was a Taylor. I love Taylors. I like Laguna a lot, but Taylors are, I love them. Um, but anyway, reduce the friction 
as well is another thing that I've been concentrating on that may help somebody out there reduce the friction to writing more, reduce the friction to whatever it might be. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, anything you can do to it. Yeah, figure out what the obstacles are and then remove those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. read Atomic Habits is what I advise somebody yes. in a coaching call recently. It's a great book. Atomic Habits is one of the most revolutionary books I've ever read. And I've read a lot of those books. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. So Rainy Dev asked, what's the best place to start learning music theory for great melodies? Um, but then related to what we were just talking about, mm -hmm. Michelle asks, I want to know how to finish more good songs, and how do I know if they're any good? Is there a barometer? Michelle's um, just trying to start a flame war. Yeah. No, if, I mean, I think it's a good question. If you like it, well, if question. you like it a lot and you can't stop listening to it, that's kind of my barometer. Because if, if you are a human being, which I assume you are, then you're probably not too weird. You're probably not too crazy. We're all crazy. We're all weird in our own way. But what I mean by that is probably other people that have similar taste to you. And so if you really like the song, other people will probably like it too. So that's but the I barometer think... that I use. That's a, I mean, that's definitely the barometer. I also think that if you have any people that you can play songs for and get their feedback, um, but even more importantly than getting feedback is if you're playing your song for someone and there's a part where you actually feel yourself internally cringe and like, you know, like every part of your body tenses up and you're like, oh, I like something feels weird about that part pay attention to what that part is because that's something sure. that you would probably want to work on. Like, is it lyrical? Is it melodic? Like what, what really is there to, um, to work on? So I think that's one thing. Um, the whole idea of good songs is so like, like subjective to each person. So it, it's hard to say like what makes a good song, but I think, what has been helpful for me over the years is using songs that I really like by other writers as a structural template. Mm -hmm. So trying to write with maybe using their rhyme scheme or maybe using like the structure of the melody, like not actually copying the melody, but um, most songs have some sort of melodic pattern where, you know, there's only a couple different phrases. Um, Joseph talked about this. Um, earlier in this uh, stream where there's really only a couple different melodic motifs within each section. So you're not really writing a huge amount of melodic stuff. And I personally think most people have good lyrical ideas. I think one of the quickest ways to improve your songwriting is to get better at melody writing, because I think it will instantly make your song sound more professional. And if you can nail a good melody, it just, it just helps so, so much. Um, I'm going to give myself a plug, but I'm doing a melody writing um, retreat for two days in March. Um, you can get to it at at home songwriting courses.com. So that's at home songwriting courses.com. Um, but it's two days. It's a Saturday and a Sunday, and we're going to spend, uh, like a lot of time focusing on that. So it's, it's all online. So you can attend where you are and it's just 157 bucks. So it'll be a good time. It'll be fun. Also, um, for the, well, I, we should probably touch on the, I guess, I guess I'll touch on the, the first question on best place to start learning music theory for great melodies, et cetera. And then, um, so, so great, great melodies. I think great melodies is a great example of write a lot of melodies and to what Chad said, think about it on try, try to work towards understanding phrases would be my advice. And it, so for example, start with something where maybe the first song you write or the next song you write, you keep it simple and just do a B a B right. Where the first phrase and the third phrase match sil syllable wise, emphasis wise, uh, the notes are the same because we're talking melody um, and then two and four and then, you know, just work on. All right, let's try a different one. Let's try A, A, B, A, A, B or A, A, B, A, A, C for the chorus, maybe. Or you just do a whole song in A, B, A, B and then try another one where you intentionally try a different um, pattern when it comes to your melody, because a lot of times it's just phrases and patterns. 
Uh, for example, a verse is your second verse and your first verse is the, is the same thing over and over again, right? Like the, the melody is going to be the same or largely the same. And a lot of times too, even within that, it is something like A, B, A, B, where really there were just two phrases, but they each happened two times. Uh, not every song, some songs, you know, admittedly, sometimes I like to have like an A, B, C, D, where it kind of takes you on more of a journey. But especially if you want to write faster, something to do is definitely pare it down, keep it simple. Um, although I think there's something to be said for going again in both directions. Also, I see the question on guitars, which I'll answer quickly because uh, so I have a what do I, LTD, I think it's called. Basically, it's the I, I got it because it's what Breaking Benjamin uses or close to what they use. Uh, it's a baritone electric guitar, um, which is for the harder rock stuff that I do. And also to help fill in the mix, I like having guitars that have different roles. So it's baritone and drop B. Um, then another one is just an Epiphone Les Paul, the blue one, which I don't think you can see technically. Um, and that I keep a half step down, but otherwise standard tuning. And then I have half step down Nashville tuning for the third guitar. I don't even remember what it was because I got it for 50 bucks from somebody and then paid a guitar guy to replace the parts and make it an actually good guitar. But also on the on the good songs thing. I think it was Chad that said, or one of you or both of you said, trust your gut, which I think is a large part of it. And trust the cringe for sure. Like, like Chad said that, that right there is, I go farther and say, if you cringe even a little bit, mm -hmm. don't ignore that. Cause okay. a lot of times I think we, we tend to like shove it aside. Like, Oh, it's, it's fine. And we rationalize it. Don't, if you cringe a little bit, almost definitely there's something wrong. Um, sometimes maybe your cringe meter is wrong, but, and, and then another thing that I like to do is really try to take one part of your song, isolate it and then test it. So for instance, sometimes I'll talk about the frame test. The idea of the frame test is to me, if your lyrics are good, they should pass as poetry because sometimes lyrics seem like they're good. But the only reason that seems like they're good is, I don't know, Celine Dion is singing them and her voice is incredible and the arrangement's good, and the melody's good. So really, it just obfuscates the fact that the lyrics are actually really terrible. Um, so to me, like a good way to test that is, I call it the frame test, because the idea is you could print out your lyrics and try to imagine them framed on a wall. Would it pass as poetry? Like if somebody just read your lyrics without the crutch of your melody or the crutch of the rest of your music and how great your arrangement is, does it still is it still good? Because if it is, then it's almost definitely good. And then do the same thing for your melody, where like, are, is your melody really powerful even without the lyrics? Is the melody powerful even without the chord progression helping it out? And then, of course, you can do it with the arrangement as well. Because uh, you know your arrangement is interesting if you can take the, the vocal out of it, and it's still interesting. I don't think it has to be if any of them you don't, if any test I think is optional and you really don't have to do is that one. But if you can take the vocal away and your arrangement is still interesting, then almost definitely it's a really interesting arrangement. So you can test it like that, uh, which at least I found helpful. Yeah, going back to the that cringe thing, something I've even found that I've tried to embrace is I found myself early on when I was writing songs, I like to, uh, originally I was just writing music because I wanted new music to listen to that I enjoyed. So I'm gonna write a song for myself that I like. And I found myself like skipping ahead to my favorite part. And I realized, oh, wait a minute. If I'm skipping ahead, that means I don't like these other parts as well. Even if they're not cringy, if you don't like them enough to skip to them, rewrite them. That's what I've done. And so I want to make sure that every part is good enough that I'd want to skip to that part and just listen to that part over and over. Um, there was a really good question. Jordan asked a question. Um, <laughs> What was our experience when we first realized we were interested in songwriting and what was the process initially developing the skills? Um, so for me, it was when I was a kid and I would listen to the radio and I would want to like do what they were doing. Like I was really, when I was a kid, I was really into the Pointer Sisters, <laughs> which sounds funny, but like in the eighties, like their song jump and like, uh, I'm so excited, <laughs> automatic, like all of these songs were really initial influences for me. And I, so what I started to do was like, I got a tape 
tape recorder actually and i started singing um just my own lyrics and songs into just a cassette tape recorder i couldn't actually do music or anything but um it was just sort of like trying to figure out how do i um make that sound and then eventually i begged my parents for a keyboard and i kind of taught myself how to play along with songs that i liked and really just learned from imitation i think is how i started to learn but then as an adult um did a lot more studying went to berkeley um you know have taken about every songwriting course that there is written tons of songs um i've written thousands of songs over the years i'm constantly writing but that's kind of my start it's really cool it's funny dragon you, you you answering that next or all right um i probably i probably just stemmed from not having enough music because i like i kind of just fell in love with music as a teenager and listened to a ton of music and i just found there wasn't enough music that i liked so i started writing my own music so huh. I, yeah i even I like yeah, i had this one sales job in college where i had to go door to door selling and it was so miserable that before i went out i'd write myself a new song so i guess that goes back to <laughs> learning to being forced to write quickly but i'd write myself a song put it on my uh, phone and then I listened to that song over and over again as I dropped flyers in people's mailboxes and then the next day I'd be bored of that song so I'd write a new song and that's kind of how I got into it. Hmm. I feel like our our journeys are a little more because I feel like there's two journeys you hear a lot and none of us quite fit into that mold but um, mine is kind of a weird one because I think a lot of people assume that it started with music and then went to lyrics and for a lot of i think it's because most songwriters are that right they're essentially musicians and then they're like i don't want to just cover songs i want to have my own so then which i think is why a lot of people treat lyrics like second class citizens because they're musicians at heart so naturally a musician at heart is going to treat lyrics like a second class citizen whereas people who start as poets are not uh, which, by the way, is another common type of songwriter, although way less common, at least from what I've seen in my experience. I've had a, maybe a couple people reach out to me and be like, hey, I'm a, I am was a poet first. Um, but but in my case, it was kind of both. Uh, so it was largely like Chad's story where, you know, it, it started with just I, I knew I there was something about certain artists that I listened to that resonated with me. And I thought I want to do that, not just singing their songs. I want to have my own. Um, but growing up, I was in like all those like writing classes at the library and then you get to be in this book and you did short stories and poetry and all that. So I did poetry and all that, but I also was in piano lessons and guitar lessons. And eventually I realized that I wanted to pair those two things up because I, 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 I deeply care about words. Uh, I care, I care about words <laughs> a lot. Uh, wh whether it's just an everyday speech and trying to be precise about what we're trying to say or whether it be precision of a lyric or, you know, well-written story, great storytelling, whatever it might be. But um, so in my case, I kind of came to it in a two pronged way. It started with just rewriting lyrics for songs that existed is how it started when I was like a kid, because I feel like it's really hard to I feel like kids don't have that level of because songwriting is not as simple as drawing and I'm not diminishing drawing. Of course, that takes incredible talent and all that. But like it is something where a five year old can get started easier than songwriting because songwriting has multiple different arts put into one. Um, just like, you know, movie making has multiple arts put into one. You're a writer, script writer. Also, you have to act in your own movie and also you have to direct. You have to know how to work a camera. There's just a little more to it. But um, yeah. And then by ninth grade, that's when I wrote what I consider my first real official song, which no one will ever hear, except my dad, who I think still has the CD, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a copy, too, which don't tell my wife, because she will probably want to try to listen to it. <laughs> uh oh, I hope she's not watching. Uh, Christopher has a great not. question. I think it's something we've actually talked about in the past. But he asks, on next open mic, would you be willing to review some song submissions if sent a week in advance? Feedback from each of you would be appreciated. We'd all learn from it. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. I also just Definitely. realized I think we all ignored the second part of Jordan's question. What, what, what so, was the process of initially developing the skill? 
<laughs> I just re-looked at it. I'm like, hmm. No, well, I think, well, for me, it was imitation, right? It was sort of like oh, looking yeah. at how are people doing it and and um, just trying to mimic what I heard. You know, I think I think there's a lot of structure in songs that that you can use, like where does the title fit in the chorus or like what is what is just the song structure? Like whatever genre you listen to usually has some sort of pattern of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, those types of things. Um, I think that so doing song um, reviews and song critiques, that's something that my um, online group at home songwriting does uh, periodically, probably about once a quarter. We also do um, songwriting challenges where they get uh, criteria that I give them and then they have either a week or a month to write a song and then um, we get together and we listen to them and give feedback. So that's something that we've done. It would be cool to do on a live like this, but we'd have to make sure that no one has released the music that we're reviewing yeah. already because we'll YouTube copyright. will ding yeah. us for copyright crap. So yeah. it would have to be a, an unreleased song. Um, that would be something that we'd have to make sure of, but, but yeah, I think mm -hmm. it'd be cool. And we'd have to make sure to get the audio set up because I know last time, I think it was Reagan tried to play something and it, we couldn't hear it. Um, yeah, I think I have, to, I have to buy a, detail, I have to buy a little a plugin to, to allow yeah, that. I, I think. And I saw that Technic Tone uh, had a shout out for Berkeley too. Um, so I actually I teach lyric writing for Berkeley. So I love I studied with Berkeley before that, but I I love Berkeley stuff. So then my no. my process process for developing my skills was just writing a song a day, uh, listening to a lot of music laying awake at night wondering why my music sounded so bad and didn't sound like the music that I heard, trying to figure out what were they doing, trying to mimic them, and and then since I couldn't sleep, writing another song that night. That was my process. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I feel I feel like I should talk about my process more. I just don't because I usually have the attitude of I'm writing content to help people. They don't care about <laughs> how how I know what I know, uh, which I think is flawed thinking because I think sometimes it can help listening to how other people uh, got there. But for me, and this will illuminate some of you who are like, he really believes in music theory. You'll see why. Because uh, for me, like it was kind of struggling through in ninth grade and 10th grade, writing stuff that was like, sometimes it worked, sometimes it just didn't work at all. And I had no idea because it, it felt stilted and wrong musically. And even if the lyrics were okay, just the music didn't, it, it just didn't sound like something that would be something that I would listen to. And I, I didn't quite know how to get it right without sort of just copying chord progressions that other artists I knew did, which is really limiting. And I, I don't know, it gets boring fast to me anyway. Um, so then in 11th grade and 12th grade is when I took music theory one and two and music composition one and two. And to this day, that's probably the biggest overnight switch flip I've had for songwriting where like, I went from feeling like I got lucky if I got any song to sound right to now I'm now I'm concerned about details, right? Like I can sit at the keyboard, not because I'm a great pianist or anything, but just because I understand music theory, uh, I can sit at the keyboard and just improvise something that sounds pretty good. Uh, so it's more about like the details and and when you are at a point where you can worry about the details musically instead, it's just it's so helpful, right? Because if, if I sit and improvise for an hour after learning music theory, like it, it's just what's the best idea I had in the hour? Not like, oh, let me pray to God that I get something that works. Like everything that I do now works for the most part. Not again, because I have any skill or anything. It's just basic music theory, right? I know, oh, I'm in G major. So here are the notes I have. And yes, I know like, oh, an interesting borrowed chord might be a major two chord here or whatever. But uh, and then from there, so getting to the advice side of it, um, I would highly advise don't fall into one of two traps. One, don't overwhelm yourself with music theory or any other knowledge. The best way to learn is to do, which both of the other two have touched on. But be intentional about learning along the way, because I think there's two traps you can get into. You can get into the trap of only doing right. So I'll relate it to YouTube. You could just make YouTube videos and never watch Think Media or somebody else that like maybe can give you tips that will get you to make better videos faster. Eventually you'll learn, but it might take you 10 years and it could have taken you two if you learn from people who already went through what you went through. But the other mistake is overwhelming yourself with too much knowledge. 
And I, I had somebody reach out to me on this. It might have been when I sent out the poll asking what your number one songwriting struggle was. But also don't be the person that's like, I don't know enough to start songwriting. You know, I don't know enough music theory. I got to learn all the music theory. Don't do that either. Every single person watching this, you know enough to start. Go write a song. If you think you don't know enough to write a song, you're wrong. You do know enough. You might not be as equipped to write as many various songs. The variation in song you can write and the depth of song you write might not be today what it will be five years from now, but that's okay. That's okay, right? Just add one thing at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself and be like, I got to take five music theory courses before I write a song. Don't do that. Just one step yeah. at a time. Learn and then do. Absolutely zero music theory when I got started. I didn't even know what chords were until months in. I didn't know what the notes on a keyboard were. And I still wrote tons of songs. Now, they were awful, but I still mm. got started and I got excited. And that's what allowed me to keep going and to learn and to get better. No one, no one like absolutely no one starts great yeah like it just doesn't happen although so joshua just... raiden's best song i still think is the first one he ever wrote which is crazy winter go check it out people it's good stuff but you yes. heard it here first you're you're 100 right says, there, Dad. joseph no, says no. your first song is going to be your best yeah yeah that's that's definitely <laughs> what i said but no chad you're 100 percent right i just figure um, i throw that out there it's, it's a good song so Nick Nick asked a question. He said, what notes do different sections usually start or end with? What notes are usually left out of each section in terms of tonic, dominant, etc.? I honestly, when I'm writing, I don't even think about that. It's all by yeah. feel. It's all by like what sounds the best. Um, you know, any chord that you have in your progression, you can either use chordal tones or non-chordal tones, right? So each one is going to give a different level of balance and resolution and i think what you choose depends on the emotion of what you're trying to say if you're saying something that's very very balanced and very very like certain and resolved then you will probably want to start on the tonic because that's as resolved and as focused as you can get you know but as far as like what are there rules there's absolutely no rules um for me, I and think also not really guidelines <laughs> and there's really not guidelines either. No, maybe the now in, in classical compositions more so probably what's that for chords more so that I don't know what they mean by notes, but if they mean like melodically, there's like literally no rules at all or guidelines at all. But when it comes to like chords, I think there's more like, for example, an easy hack for a pre-chorus is just avoid the one chord, a.k.a. the tonic. You don't have to, but it is an easy hack to make a pre-chorus not sound like the chorus that you can right. utilize but still it's like don't hear that as a rule maybe it's a guideline at best <laughs> follow up fails follow your ears do what sounds good oh, for sure <laughs> yeah and yeah. again learn from imitation like what are your favorite songs do what are they starting in a chordal tone are they starting off the chord are they starting on the ninth you know a lot of pop songs are like heavily centered on the ninth of the scale, like, do they have to? No, but it, in a lot of songs, it sounds cool. I think one of the things that people get caught up in is learning like rules. And I think Joseph, you said it where it's like, once you know a little bit of theory, you know options. Yep. So you you know what what spices you might be able to add to the to the um, to the dish. Yeah, um, and music Jeanette, theory won't give you rules, by the way. If you think no. that your music theory gives you rules, then you don't know what music theory is. Music theory is just going to give you like some parameters to understand that give you clarity on, you know, like, like, for instance, if you just understand like, okay, C major just has all the if you're on a piano, just all the white keys, right? That just is going to help you that you know that if you just hit all the white keys, and all the chords you use are white keys like you have limited yourself to only stuff that for the most part is going to work. Um, that doesn't mean you can't break outside of that. Uh, in fact, I think intentionally at some point, maybe even you should, uh, you know, for maybe a borrowed chord or whatever it might be. I don't think it's necessary. Tons of songs don't. Most songs don't. Um, but like, but don't don't hear that music theory is is rules so much as it, it gives you like templates of these notes together will work well or as as chad was talking about you know the one or the tonic is resolved right 
that's a tendency where like, yeah, if, if you want your song at the end of it to sound resolved, the one chord is the way to go. And if you're playing a chord and you're like, my song doesn't sound like it's over, but I want it to sound like it's an o over music theory is something that would help you. Cause it would explain like, Oh, well I'm playing the four chord. So that's why it doesn't sound resolved. If I play the one chord right. in root position, then it will sound resolved. If I play it in first inversion, it probably won't sound resolved. Uh, but if I do it in root position, it probably will. And if all that was Spanish to you or whatever language you don't know, that's okay. Right. Like just well, learn it slowly. I think the key word in music theory is theory too. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's just a bunch of tendencies and it's one, yep. what we think of as music theory is actually like a, a European centric focus on music. Mm -hmm. If you study other um, cultures, like in India, they have different notes that, that fall outside of what like the Western um, scales and stuff would be. So there's a yeah. whole other theory that they have. It's a whole other theory that, you know, other countries might have or other scales and different ways that they have, have instrumentation. Like um, music theory is really just studying the relationships between pitches and rhythm, right? Like that's what it really comes down to. Um, Jeanette yeah. said she took a, theory class at Columbia college where they used a fountain pen and wrote on staff. So like I've written thousands of songs and I can't read music. So you don't even have yes. to know how to read music to do this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. PSA based on what Chad just said, in case he wasn't abundantly clear, which I think he was, but let's make it even more clear. Music theory has nothing to do with sheet music, nothing at all. You can know nothing about sheet music and still be know everything about music theory. And you can know everything about sheet music and know nothing about music theory. Totally disconnected. I knew how to read sheet music since I was like six because I took classical piano lessons. Didn't know a lick of music theory when I took my first class. And I knew how to read music and not even just like vocal music, right? Like two hands doing multiple things. Pian like there's nothing harder than reading piano sheet music. I don't think. I've organ probably. But basically, right? Like the flute players out there like you have an easier time right you have to read one note a pianist has to read a whole bunch so even as somebody who had to do that i, I didn't know a lick of music theory none going into 11th grade at which point i had done over 10 years of piano lessons so i certainly knew how to read sheet music uh not that great at it because i memorize songs too quickly and i regret that greatly <laughs> but um <laughs> just just so everyone knows music theory has nothing to do with sheet music um also, also a thing about th that Reagan said that I think is worth calling back um, feel. I don't remember if I've already put a video out about this or if I just have one planned. But I notice a recurring theme with people talking about their biggest struggle. And one of those recurring themes was getting so caught up in rules or tendencies or what other artists are doing to forget to trust your own gut and to forget to just um, if it feels right, it probably is right. If you break slightly outside of the meter for one line, right? Th there's no rule that if you start in common meter, so you have four emphases, three emphases, four emphases, three emphases. If you break that rule, it's OK, <laughs> because your rhyme scheme serves your lyric, your your everything is in service to your song. Break any rule if it ever doesn't service your song. If some music theory rule or some music composition rule or something that a, a schmuck like me said on YouTube or these other two brilliant guys, if 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 we always go with what is right for your song and throw any rule or any guideline immediately out the window, if it's not in service to your song, including a rhyme scheme or like there's been songs where I had a rhyme scheme and it just. There was one line where I'm like, no, it shouldn't have it. It just it needs to say this. And you know what? Nobody's going to notice either. So make sure it's it's all in service to your song. Great, great advice. Yeah, that's that's what it really boils down to. Are, are you able to create Does a song create? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Right. Music, lyrics, it's all meant that music. It's meant to communicate. It's a form of communication. It communicates. Mm -hmm. Ideas through the lyrics, the music itself communicates emotions. It's like a, a shorthand, it's a way to transfer emotions to someone. So does it make you dance if the song is supposed to make you dance? Does it make you 
feel sad? Does it make you feel contemplative if that's what it's supposed to do? So if it's doing what it's supposed to do, then you're probably in the right ballpark there. Mm. So we should probably awesome. wrap up here. Um, I did see Technic Tone had this good question that I've been thinking a lot recently about how to get feedback. So that would be really useful. I think he's talking about us reviewing songs. So for sure, I think that's something we should do going forward. Another thing to keep in mind about feedback, though, is be careful. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes feedback can be a bad thing because you want to make sure you're getting feedback from the right people, meaning the people that like the kind of music that you create, right? So someone could send me a country song to listen to. <laughs> I'm probably not going to like it because I don't like yeah, country I'm in the music. Same so boat. That's the same thing for like any business, right? If you're trying to market your product to the wrong audience, it's not going to sell. It doesn't mean you have a bad product. It just means it's not the right audience. So you want to make sure you're getting feedback from the right people. And so hopefully we're the ones uh, for that, right? Probably if you're following us, you probably like the kind of music that we create or have talked about. Um, so hopefully... Uh, we can provide some good feedback uh, in the future live stream. And just one last thing on that: find, find, try to find people that can separate their as as much as possible their by own biases from what they think preferences. is yeah. yeah preferences versus versus because there are some things right that I think are just more objectively better or worse, and then there are other things that I think this is a sub subjective thing. Do you like lyrics that are a little more clean cut and like like? last example but like even depending on the genre i write the harder rock stuff tends to be way more symbolic and and vague than my singer songwriter mm -hmm. stuff because i think it just fits the music or the lyrics tend to be way darker for that because it sounds like darker music so also try to find people that are going to see through whatever bias or whatever whatever their preferences are and at least try to help you with what you're trying to accomplish because your goal is not to write a song that they would approve of, what I would approve of, of Reagan or anybody else, but to write the the song to the best of your ability that that is what you are trying to go for, um, which is not trivial. But mm -hmm. if you can find that, that would be helpful. But yeah, you could try right, go on Instagram and see people that follow your favorite artist that makes music like yours, and look at the people that are commenting on their stuff, and maybe just send them a message and say, hey. I really like this artist too. I make music that I think kind of sounds like theirs. Would you mind listening to it and telling me what you think? Right. Cause it's not really, you're not really like promoting like, Hey, go listen to my music. You're asking them for feedback. That's something you could try too. So that, mm -hmm. you know, you're reaching out to the people that are in the same, like the same kind of music that you like. Mm -hmm. But asking a stranger, you kind of risk them being a total jerk on the internet too. Yeah. So you gotta be open to that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I, I do door to door to, sales, so I'm used to rejection. I'm yeah. used to people screaming and running what, when they see me coming. So I think what you have to do is you have to take in all of the feedback and not instantly react to it either. Like if somebody says this part could be a different way, stop and think like, is that just because they would have done it in a different way? Or is there actually something that's quote unquote wrong with it? Right? Like, like if, if somebody comes to you and says, what the hell just happened in the second verse? Like, I don't get it. That's different feedback than, oh, I would have used a different rhyme there, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it communicating the right thing? Um, yeah. What is the favorite song they've written? Where can we go hear it? It's probably um, a good wrap up question. Yeah. I mean, just search for my name, Chad Shank, on any of the streaming sites and you'll see stuff that I like that I've put out. I could not name a favorite song of mine, I have too many. Depends on the day. Yeah, it was a tough, it was a tough one. I would probably, probably my favorite songs that I've written aren't published yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I was gonna say. All my favorite fifteen song, to twenty of my favorites are not published. Yet. I will say I just um, finished writing a song that, ironically, I wrote like seven years ago but never finished. So, Joseph, <laughs> right, needed time to brew, uh, and so I went back to it. Uh, just recently and then uh, finished it up. And so I'm just working on putting the final touches on that and hoping to release that at the end of this month, maybe beginning of next month. And that might be my favorite song that I've written up to this point in time. Uh, otherwise, you can look me up at Andromeda Coast and that's on Spotify and all the other streaming platforms. Uh, for me, yeah, I reflect what Reagan said and or yeah. Probably my 20 favorite songs were all not released. It's dangerously close to that. 
Uh, and some of songs that I've released are currently not able to be found because I wrote them when I was 18 and I am, I just, <laughs> I, I don't have the heart to put them back up, but, uh, of the available ones, my favorite is probably won't be tonight. Although I have a bias to it. It's it, that is the song that for me magically came together in half an hour. Uh, so that kind of have this, has a special place in my heart for that reason. It just was like the perfect something happened to me for the first time in my life. And after crying for like 50 hours and <laughs> watching everybody loves Raymond for 50 hours, uh, I finally was like, I'm a songwriter. I probably should use this and write a song. Shouldn't I? Um, so won't be tonight is my favorite. I just have a channel, Joseph Vidala music with not as much published as I should have. Uh, but other people tend to like sick machine, which is a little more of the rock side of what I do. And a lot of people like hello reality, which I think is a great sarcastic lyric. Um, I'm proud of that lyric, but the, it's 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 like a poppy experiment song. It literally was me be like, like, let, can I write a poppy catchy song? Because I'm so sick of just being always like emotional and big melodies. Uh, well, not not always angsty, but but certainly more. Uh, I go for sad feels more than I do happy ones, for sure. And this one is like a happy song. Or seems like a happy song, but really it's <laughs> a pretty savage song. Yeah, I like and a good for some sad reason song. people like that. A good what? A good sad song. Those are always nice. Yeah, I enjoy this. I agree. Actually, that reminds me of a of a of a discussion topic that maybe we can have next time. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Well, this was fun, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Was... Thank you so much, everyone who tuned in. It was great. You made the stream amazing with all your comments. So. Thank you so much for tuning in and pay attention to your inboxes because we might be emailing you before the next one to look for song submissions to review. So mm. stay tuned. And to come asking, when is the next live stream? I don't think we have one. We'll have scheduled. to figure that out. <laughs> we try to do <laughs> yeah. one a month if possible. So yeah, that was the idea anyway. We'll see. We, we missed December. I think we can maybe promise once a quarter at least probably. Hopefully. Yeah, I've got some other live streams with other songwriters and stuff on my channel, but for this one, I don't. We don't have anything else set up yet. Yeah, but we can change that. Yeah. Also, let us know. Like, it, it's it's hard to know how many people care, or because I know more people watch. Maybe in the future, more people are are watching than are commenting. Probably. Um, so let us know via email. You know, if if you really are like. I love live streams. Please keep doing them slash, you know, here's ideas for them. Let us know. Cause yeah, I think I everybody always assumes more. that we know how much people like stuff, but we don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you don't tell us, we don't. And everybody always assumes like, Oh, they must get like tons of feedback. Not as much as you think you'd be surprised with a <laughs> decent sized, whether it's email list or subscribers or whatever, how little people will tell you about any given thing. Right. So, for instance, the only feedback I've gotten about the live stream is actually via Chad. Somebody let Chad know. Uh, literally, I don't think I've gotten a single email saying whether oh, they sunny. hate the live stream. The flying cat. Know, they think Reagan's so face looks it. funny. They think I look awful <laughs> I with the that, camera right? that I choose. I haven't gotten any feedback. I look like a fool. My hair do stupid. I don't I know. I think I got Nobody's my first compliment <laughs> from a, that my, they liked my hair in one of my YouTube shorts. That was like the first compliment I've ever gotten. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> nice. Hey, that's a good compliment. And my it's wife cuts weird. my hair, so let's got to give her the credit. <laughs> I just can't imagine watching a video <laughs> of somebody like talking about not hair and being like, nice hair, bro. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> their, their, their picture was Yoda, so I'm like, oh, I really like your oh. skin. Nice <gasps> shade of green. Green. Awesome. <laughs> Joseph, get more guitars. Uh, tell, tell my wife. Uh, I'll tell my wife that I need to get more guitars because Tecumseh Thorpe, which is that's such a that's such a cool YouTube name, by the way, um, unless it's your real name, which would be extra, extra cool. But I just assume it's not. It doesn't seem like it could be, <laughs> but you never know. Uh, but I have on good authority. It's not we'll their real name. I figured it was. I, I think I know who Tecumseh Thorpe is. I, I figure it wasn't, but it's a sweet YouTube name. It's very cool. Cool. Anyway, name. thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks so much. And thank you. Chad and Joseph, it's always fun chatting. I liked controversy. Hopefully, uh, you guys did too, because I like I like getting in, into those kinds of discussions. Hey, I have an idea that we should everyone start with something we disagree with. Yeah, I, think it I like makes that. More interesting that, and everybody gets to choose, pick and choose, like what they think is best from 
Because some people are going to lean more towards my way and some are going to lean more towards you guys' way. I don't think either is right or wrong necessarily. But I think everyone can learn from everybody's perspective. But anyway, you're trying to wrap up. Yes. Anyway, yeah. have a great night. So we'll anyway, see you around. Be sure to subscribe to Joseph and Chad. They've got great channels that will help you write better music. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. See you forever.